Welcome! My name is Laura Itar, and in this lecture I will explain energy flexibility in buildings and how to enhance it by passive and active heating and cooling solutions at the demand, distribution and supply sites. It entails passive heating, maximum use of building mass and slim thermostat settings and also buffers. Finally, you will discover how to integrate flexibility in the supply and distribution sites using a typical example. When we discussed space heating demand in another lecture, we saw the importance of heat recovery ventilation. But there is more possible to reduce high heating and cooling peaks. For instance, cold outdoor ventilation air can be first preheated in an earth tube taking it from the ground, which is in winter always warmer than air. Another way of preheating air can be with so-called double-skinned facades, in which air is circulated in cavities and indirectly heated by solar radiation during sunny winters. Earth tubes can also be used for the cooling of ventilation air. In general, the shallow ground is colder than outdoor air during the hot season. Instead of the ground, it is also possible to use surface water, like a pond, a river, or a lake, or the sea. Finally, evaporative cooling can be used. Evaporative cooling is possible due to the ability of water to evaporate when the air is not saturated, taking a lot of it from its environment. It is also possible to heat and cool indirectly by using the full potential of building mass. We discussed in another lecture that the absorption of solar radiation in a construction costs time, by which the solar gains in a room are delayed by a number of hours. Let's take now the example of an atrium. Facade and roof are from glass and the floor in brown under is from concrete, having a heavy mass. The atrium is not cooled, neither heated, so the indoor air temperature will vary. The concrete floor is heated by the incoming solar radiation. Heat is transported by convection towards the bottom of the floor, by conduction, sorry, and by convection towards the air that becomes warmer. When the sun stops shining, this process is continued up to the moment everything goes back to equilibrium. This whole process may be much shorter, just two or three hours, if the building mass is low, like in timber frame construction, or even much longer if thick concrete or stone walls are used. In the static energy balance, like we did in, uh, in the lecture about energy demand, we did not model these delays. These delays are not so important when, when looking over one full year, but when looking at the hourly level, they do impact the heating power and temperature. For instance, if the thermostat of an office building is set at 15 degrees, the temperature in the building will not drop down instantaneously like the blue one in the graphic. Rather, the heating will stop, like in the orange dotted line, and the temperature will decrease slowly. This reality can only be modeled using dynamic heat balances, based on the heat equation for the construction. In software like Energy Plus, ESPR, Transys, etc., these delays are obviously correctly modeled using partial differential heat equations. Let's take the example of the heating profile of an office building. During office hours, the indoor temperature is kept constant and the heating load varies with outdoor temperature, solar radiation, internal gains and ventilation. At a certain time, for example 6 p.m., people go home and the heating stops. In the morning, for instance 8 p.m., it starts again. During the night, the temperature goes down slowly to 15 degrees and at 8 e.m., a huge heating power is needed to bring the building back to 22 degrees within one hour. 
As all of his buildings in the city, so to speak, at the same moment, it may cause problems of stability in the grid, especially when heat pumps are used, and of availability in heating grids. A common solution is shown in the graphic below. The heating starts earlier, let's say three hours earlier, but at a three times lower load. After three hours, the building will have achieved the temperature needed at 8 EM. The energy usage is not changed, but the, need, but the needed power has been reduced by three. This is, by the way, already applied for decades to save investment costs as it decreases the nominal power of the heating. See here, the nominal power in the first case, and here with thermostat shifting. Another way of playing with the heating demand is to make full use of the fact that the indoor temperature does not need to be exactly 22 degrees. There is a wall range, mostly between 19 and 23, in which people feel comfortable during winter. So, like here, in the morning. It is possible to heat less while the temperature is still within the comfort bandwidth. This can allow to buy less energy when it is expensive, or when less renewable energy is available. Oppositely, if the energy in that period is cheap or renewable-based, you can choose for buying as much as possible, producing the maximum load of heat and storing the part that is not needed, the hedged area, in order to use it later on. Le Let's look now at the possibilities in cooling mode. In red, you see a typical temperature profile of an office building during a hot day. The temperature in the afternoon is maintained at 25 degrees. At 6 p.m., people go home and the cooling is switched off. See the blue line. Because it is still hot outdoor and the sun is still shining, the indoor temperature first increases before decreasing during the night. As soon as the sun shines again, the temperature increases and the building is already too hot before 8 a.m., by which high cooling power is needed. Just like we did for heating, you could start the cooling earlier to limit the peak load. Even smarter is to ventilate the building during the night with large quantities of colder outdoor air. This way, the temperature in the morning is much lower. By using PCM, you can make use of the latent heat of liquefaction and solidification of the PCM. Big disadvantage is that it is an intermittent system. Once the PCM is completely liquefied or solidified, the process stops and must be reversed. Let's take a PCM with phase change temperature 22 degrees. A battery of PCM is used along with the ventilation air, behaving like a storage tank in the distribution system. Starting from the heating season and from liquid PCM, if cold outdoor air is circulating through the PCM, the PCM will solidify, giving its heat to the air, which will therefore be heated up to 90 degrees. Once the PCM is solidified, the process stops and the PCM must be regenerated. To melt, it needs heat above 22 degrees, so the indoor air has to be heated further, preferably by waste heat, otherwise it is nonsense to use PCMs in heating season. The cooling season is much more appropriate. During the day, hot air is being heated by the PCM, which melts. At night, cold outdoor air is fed to the PCM, which solidifies again. The warm air obtained can be used inside or be rejected to outdoor. Let's look now further at flexibility in the distribution system and consider a heat generator providing heat to radiators in a room or to an air handling unit. In systems with mechanical parts, like the compressor of a heat pump, water buffers are always used to limit the amount of starting times of the equipment, which is detrimental to their service life. Instead of water, phase change materials or thermochemical materials can be used with the advantage of their high latent heat. In this four pipes configuration, all heat produced by the generator goes first to the tank. The tank is then tapped to the room emitter or to the air handling unit. 
On the same way, the colder water returning from the emitter goes through the tank and a pipe at the other side brings it back to the generator. When the tank is warm, it can deliver heat to the rooms and airing unit while the generator is off. A cold buffer would be designed similarly, but this time the tank is tapped at the bottom where the water is the coldest. A main advantage of a buffer is to provide peak load capacity in such a way that the generators can be sized smaller. A tank is much cheaper than a heat or cold generator, so that is financially advantageous. In this picture, you see the heating load for the coldest months of the year. As you have learned in another lecture, you would normally choose a heat generator with a nominal power of 425 kilowatt, the maximum in the graphic. But you can also choose to take one of 300 kilowatt only and have it running continuously in some periods in order to charge the buffer at night when nobody is in the building. This way you save on the investments and additionally, with the increasing flexibility of energy markets, it may be very useful to store heat when the fuel price is low or when renewable energy is provided. And when the prices are high or the energy is non-renewable, you can use the buffer tank. Geothermal plants are mostly designed to work year-round at constant load and cannot be controlled very easily. If the heating profile of the wall neighborhood resembles this one, it would not be wise to size the geothermal plant like this. An enormous surplus of heat would be produced, see the purple surface, that would have to be destroyed. It is much better to size it like that. In the summer, the produced geothermal heat must then be stored in an aquifer thermal storage to be used in winter. And such an aquifer thermal storage works like that. Let's start with the summer situation. If we pump the cold water from the aquifer, we can transfer heat from the warm air to the aquifer water in the heat exchanger. So the cold water from the aquifer is pumped and heated by the warm air up to 20 degrees in this example. This aquifer water at 20 degrees is then injected into the warm well. This is done all summer, resulting in a bubble of warm water at the warm well. As sense thermal conductivity is not very high, the bubble of heat is able to remain for a few months. And then winter arrives, where we need heat. The heat that has been stored in the warm well can then be used by just reversing the flows. Now the warm water is pumped to the heat exchanger in which it gives its heat to the evaporator of the heat pump. Because the heat source has now a high temperature, the COP will be high too. Let's look now at a modern aquifer thermal energy storage system in a university building and study its flexibility by looking at its working modes. The ATES system is here. It is connected to a heat pump that can also be used as chiller. If the capacity of the heat pump is not enough, there is an additional boiler. They all provide heat or cold to a water system, a flue heating and cooling system, going to the rooms and they also provide heat and cold to the ventilation air, the green lines. The air is heated or cooled in the air handling unit, AHU. There is, heat there is also a heat recovery unit. Finally, there is also a dry cooler in which water is cooled by outdoor air. It can be used for night cooling or to reject it heat from the chiller. In the next slide, gray lines are non-active, red ones are heating, blue ones cooling and the air is in green. When the system is in full load heating mode, which happens at cold outdoor temperatures, the heat pumps uses the warm well as heat source. Cold is therefore loaded in a cold well. The capacity of the heat pump is not high enough, so heating water is heated further in the boiler and distributed to the floor heating system and the heater in the air handling unit. When it is less cold outdoor, the system works the same, except that the boiler is not used. 
In many office and educational buildings, there is already cooling needed in the mid-season. Although it is still cold outside, solar gains and internal heat loads cause a surplus of it. In this case, the dry air cooler delivers cold to the air handling unit and to the floor cooling if needed. This is all free, cool this is all free cooling. When it becomes warmer outside and more cooling is needed, the cold well is used and delivers all needed cold to the air handling unit and the floor cooling system. This is called passive cooling, and by doing so, heat is loaded to the warm well. In full load cooling, water from the cold well delivers cold to the air handling unit and sometimes also additional cold to the chilled water from the evaporator of the heat pump. By doing this, heat is loaded to the warm well. The heat produced at the condenser side of the heat pump is wasted to the air through the dry air cooler. If needed, it can also be injected into the warm well. Not in this picture, there are also other working modes. For instance, it is also possible to heat some of the rooms while cooling others. Meeting rooms, for instance, need cooling also in winter. So, summarizing, in this lecture you are now aware about the importance of energy flexibility. You know how to enhance it at the demand side by applying passive heating and cooling techniques and by making maximal use of the thermal mass of buildings by starting heating earlier or using night ventilation for cooling. You are aware of the use of water and PCM tanks to store energy and understand how it helps with playing with the nominal power to reduce the peaks or to store energy when it is cheap or green. Finally, you've got some understanding about how to integrate this knowledge into the design of complex ATS systems for buildings. Goodbye. Thank you for listening.